World War II, millions upon millions upon millions died. Today, in our time, in our years, in Syria, for instance, many, many have died and are dying. And so much of the time, we're shielded from that. We hear it in the news, but it's, it's electrons on a screen. It's true, but we're shielded from that. And because of that shielding, we can become uh, very uh, flabby, weak, uh, think that we're OK without any problems to say so to speak and uh, because we have all the latest things I mean well today we didn't have air conditioning as bad as good <laughs> it's amazing how weak we are and spiritually we lose it and our young children don't know any better because, you know, we don't help them in our life situation, our wealth, and their, all the comforts of life are here. In Revelation 17, we'll eventually get to Psalm 74, but in Revelation 17, God is speaking to the churches. Uh, I'm sorry, Revelation 3, verse 17. Revelation 3, verse 17. And in one of the churches, the, churches, uh, the church of Laodicea, uh, they were very wealthy and, uh, you know, they felt like, well, who needs God, really? Oh, yes, we need God here and there. But, and God came, Jesus came to them and scolded them and spoke truth to them. And this is what he said. Revelation 3, and verse 17. Because you say, I am rich, and have become wealthy, and have need of nothing, and you do not know that you are wretched, and miserable, and poor, and blind, and naked. Wow. They didn't feel that. They didn't feel that they were naked and wretched. They felt things were great. Now, that doesn't mean that we go out and punish ourselves and cut ourselves and so that we can feel the pain, right? No, 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 no. That doesn't mean that. That doesn't mean that. But what keeps us? What's going to keep us in reality, so to speak? You know what it is? Being in touch with God's will in our lives and in the lives of others. In a word, the kingdom of God. When we are more aware of God's will in our lives, then you know what begins to show up? That we're not doing God's will. When we begin to talk about the gospel, that Jesus Christ died for our sins, and that this is what we need to be communicating, and that this is what we're supposed to be helping others, to know Christ and disciple them and reach out to others, we find out that we really are not. We begin to be concerned about ourselves, 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 and ourselves, and fear grips us, and we are no longer living for God. For the kingdom of God, we become spiritually asleep. And when disaster comes, if any disaster comes, we can't handle it. We, we go crazy. Uh, and the disaster can be personal, right? Just me, something that happened to me. Or it can ha happen to our community, our family, our church. Or it can happen to the whole nation. 
But when it comes, if we have not really been thinking and living for the kingdom of God, doing God's will, then we're not going to be prepared. In fact, when we're not worried about the kingdom of God, we stay superficial. Worried about things that really are not about the gospel. Uh, I'm worried about whether I'm have a, uh, and these things are good, by the way. They're not bad, only they're secondary. Uh, am I going to have good children? Am I going to have a, a good marriage? Am I going to uh, do well in school? Am I going to have enough money for retirement? Am I going to, and those things are not bad. But really, we skip the gospel. We skip the, the will of God. And sometimes God has to bring disaster so that we wake up and smell the coffee. And um, I've said this in the past. I don't know. You know, I'm not a prophet or a son of a prophet. But... The way things are in the world, the way things are here in the United States, doesn't look too good. Doesn't look too pretty for the future. And maybe the Lord is getting ready to wake us up. And we need to be about the kingdom so that we're not caught off guard, you see, and panic. Psalm 74 is about disaster. It's about disaster. Disaster hit the whole nation of Israel. And uh, we need to know how do we respond in disaster? Whether it's personal, whether it's uh, our family, our church, our nation, how do we respond? How, how can we be prepared? And in Psalm, 73, uh, Psalm 74, I write, in overwhelming disaster, in overwhelming disaster, God's people must recall God's sovereign power and continue to earnestly pray. When overwhelming disaster comes, God's people must recall God's sovereign power and earnestly pray. When we talk about prayer, it's about relationship. You know, if you have a friend and you talk to them once a year and all of a sudden something happens to you, you probably are not going to call that friend, right? Unless you've been spending regular time with that person. And that's what we need with God, an ongoing relationship with God. Because disasters do come. Why are we so sure that disasters come? Because we live in a fallen world. We live in a fallen world. As much as we want to deny and prepare and, 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 and have all our monies and all our, you know, 401ks and all our monies aside and all the health and all the pills and all the doctors in line whenever I need this or that, disaster comes. We live in a fallen world. Psalm 74 is written by the national worship leader of Israel. The national worship leader of Israel, Asaph. Um, so he knew he was very in tune with God's will, God's intentions, uh, the kingdom of God. And he was also very aware and, and, and knew the content of the temple and all that went in the temple and all the furnishings and, and, and emblems that reminded uh, the people of the salvation of God. Kind of like when we enter here, we have a stained glass window that reminds us of the great work of God, the cross. And on the, on the other windows, we have symbols of Christian life, right? A dove and a Bible and a candle, the light of God and so forth to remind us, to remind us. And so Asaph knew about all that, you see. Uh, but disaster had come. 
Disaster had come to the nation. How to respond? And so Asaph, I think, is expressing on behalf of the nation what's going on. And he's calling out to God. And then he makes it personal about his own faith. And we're going to see that. And then he prays to God. Psalm 74 is what's called a lament psalm. And some of you might remember we went over the lament psalms. Uh, those were personal, individual lament psalms. This is what's called a, a communal or a national lament psalm. Like a whole community is lamenting. And if you remember, there were five parts to a lament psalm. Even though this is a communal so a lament psalm, there was the initial cry to God. Then there was the lament proper, meaning here's the real problem, God. It's, it's, it's lamentable, and we're powerless to do anything about it. And then there was a, a section on the confession of trust. In the midst of disaster, there was a section on a trust of God, even though we're going through what we're going through. And then there was the petition proper, where the, the psalmist prays to God for specific things. And then there was the final section, a call to praise or a vow to praise. What we have in this psalm are the first four parts, but there's not a section on a vow to praise. And so, again, the Psalms, the more you understand what's happening in the structure, the more you can get out of it, the more you can apply it to your own lives. And that's why I go over it, you see, so that you can, okay, maybe you can draw lines or something and then go back and understand what's going on with the Psalm. Um, so before I break it down, I also want to say that the probability is that this, the, the historical background, and in many of the Psalms too, the more the historical background, if you know the historical background, is going to help you understand what's going on. Why are they responding the way they are? And the historical context of this Psalm, Psalm 74, is probably when the nation of Israel, the southern part, was taken into captivity by Babylon. Babylon had come in and just ransacked. They destroyed the nation, and then they took the people into captivity. They took them away from their homes. It's like somebody used to come here, and all of a sudden, all our bank accounts, all our cars, all our lands, all our houses, everything's taken away, and you're deported somewhere. And you have no rights. All your churches, everything's gone. That's what had happened to the people. You see? God had come to discipline his children because they refused, they refused, they refused to listen to his word. And Babylon had come and just ransacked everything, including the temple. And Asaph, the national worship leader, was very, very in tune. And he allowed himself to hurt he just didn't throw out theological things and verses and so forth. To, no, he allowed himself to hurt. And the Psalms, remember, when we introduce the Psalms, it's what I call raw soul. I mean, here's my heart, God. You see? And I think Asaph is describing, uh, expressing for the whole nation. So um, the way I break this down is uh, the first three verses of Psalm 74 are the initial cry for intervention. But in that initial cry, really the first three verses is really a summary of the whole psalm. Okay? So it's the initial cry, but with summary of the whole psalm. Verses 4 through 11 is the overwhelming disaster. That's the lament proper. It's an overwhelming disaster that happened to the nation. Verses 12 to 17 is the trust in God's sovereign omnipotence. Trust in God's sovereign, overwhelming power over all creation. And he has to look back. That's the confession of trust. And then 18 through 23, prayer to restore praise of God. God, help us be restored in praising you. This is the petition proper. And we're going to be, it's very interesting how the psalmist tries to motivate God. 
in prayer. It's amazing. So let's look at it. Let me read the psalm, Psalm 74. Uh, and again, as we read, you may not be going through disaster now, or you may. Or there might be pending disaster. This is about disaster. And how do we deal? How is the, the believer to deal with disaster? Okay. So we begin in the first three verses, the initial cry and summary, really, of the whole psalm. Oh, God, why have you rejected us forever? Why does your anger smoke against the sheep of your pasture? Remember your congregation, which you have purchased of old, which you have redeemed to be the tribe of your inheritance. This Mount Zion, where you have dwelt, turn your steps towards the perpetual ruins. The enemy has damaged everything within the sanctuary. Your adversaries have roared in the midst of your meeting place. They have set up their own standards for signs. The Hebrew words are the same there for standard and signs. They're like that. They're emblems. They're insignias. They're, they're flag. They're taking hours and throwing it away and put their flag. That's the sense. It seems as if one had lifted up an axe in the forest trees. And now all the carved wood, and they smashed it with the hatchet and, and hammers. They have burned your sanctuary to the ground. They have defiled the dwelling place of your name. They said in their heart, let us completely subdue them. They have, they have burned all the meeting places of God in the land. We do not see our emblems, our signs. There's no longer any prophet, nor is there among us anyone who knows how long, how long, oh Lord, will the adversary revile, the enemy spurn your name forever. Why do you withdraw your hand, even your right hand, from within your bosom destroy? Yet God is, our, is my king from of old, who works deeds of deliverance in the midst of the earth. You divided the sea by your strength. You broke the heads of the sea monsters in the water. You crushed the heads of the Leviathan. You, uh, you gave him as food for the creatures of the wilderness. You broke open the springs and torrents. You dried up ever-flowing streams. Yours is the day. Yours is the night. You have prepared the light and the sun. You have established all the boundaries of the earth. You made summer and winter. Remember this, O oh Lord, that the enemy has reviled and a foolish people has spurned your name. Do not deliver the soul of your turtle dove to the wild beasts. Do not forget the life of your afflicted forever. Consider the covenant. For the dark places of the land are full of, ha of habitations of violence. Let not the oppressed return dishonored. Let the afflicted and the needy praise your name. Arise, O God, and plead your own cause. Remember how the foolish man reproaches you all day long. Do not forget the voice of your adversaries, the uproar of those who raise, rise against you which, you, which ascend continually. The psalmist is being very, very honest. Very honest. And being poetry, you get the sense of sometimes exaggeration to make a point, and the feelings that are there, the feelings that are there, and uh, I personally have experienced some of this in a smaller scale at a personal level. And so I understand some of the things that he says. For instance, at the very beginning, when he says, uh, Oh God, why have you rejected us forever? You know, when you're in the middle of pain, when you're in the middle of hurt, it seems like this is the way it's going to be forever and ever and ever. 
There's no end to my pain. And that's what he's expressing. God, why have you forsaken us forever? You ever feel that way? My lot in life is always going to be the same. All the time. Right? And so the psalmist is. This is the way I feel, God. You've rejected us. We're done. And then he says, um, why does your anger, why does, in other words, it's not why did your anger still smoke? No, your anger is still smoking. You're still against us. We're in the middle of this. This brother is being very honest. And remember, he is the worship leader. And talking to God like that. Can you imagine us Christians being honest with God? <laughs> we don't even know what that means. But this brother, the worship leader, was being very honest with God. <laughs> God, you've abandoned us. It seems forever. And you're still cooking us. You're still roasting us. Smoke is still... That's the way I feel, God. But I want you to note... What are the very first words of that psalm? Oh, God. He is turning to God. Very, very important. Oh, God. And then he appeals to God. Remember. And when the Hebrew word says remember, it's not just recall. God, remember. Take action, God. That's the sense. God, remember your congregation, which you purchased of all. You have redeemed to, uh, to be tribe of your inheritance. God, this is your work. This is your salvation plan. Israel is to be your people. You paid a huge price to purchase us. You suffered a lot to purchase us, God. And so you get the sense of... Not just this is going to be forever, but you get the sense, too, that the psalmist is confused. There's confusion. Let me tell you. Let me ask you. You ever confused about how God is working things? I am at times. Some people that are evil, evil, seem to be so happy. Seem to be get away with, with so much. And I'm going, God, uh... Uh, what's up? And then sometimes we're trying to do what is right. And boom, we're down. And we try to do something else that's right. And boom, we're down. It's like, what's up? You know? And I think this psalmist is like, God, uh, Israel, you paid a huge price. You purchased, you redeemed this to be your tribe of your inheritance. And then on top of that, the last part of verse 2, this Mount Zion, where you have dwelt. Mount Zion is uh, uh, the name for Jerusalem. And in Jerusalem, we had the center of worship. And in Jerusalem, we had the center of God's government. And the psalmist is saying, God, you chose Mount Zion to be the center of your government and the center of your worship. This is where people come and worship you. What's up? I'm confused, God. That's the psalmist. You see? And once again, we see the psalmist being raw soul. Here's the truth, God. Take action because it's confusing. Then he says in verse 3, uh, turn your footsteps towards the perpetual ruins. <laughs> Do something, God, because it looks like it's ruined forever. Do something. T turn your footsteps. The enemy has damaged everything within the sanctuary. The most precious, sacred place that belongs to you God huh and that's the summary of the whole psalm psalmist is being very honest and I think our young people need honesty 
from us adults that sometimes it is confusing. And sometimes we feel powerless. Sometimes we have no answers. We need to be honest. And sometimes that we're hurting. And sometimes we're hurting because of their behavior. Not that we condemn them, but it hurts. You know, the context says, uh, the psalm, or the, the historical context of the psalm says, God was disciplining his children. Because they refused, and they refused, and they refused, and they refused. And God had to come and discipline. Now, the Babylonians apparently went too far. And now the, the children of Israel, are, through Asaph, are crying out for mercy. But God was disciplining them. Amazing. Uh, disciplining his own children, his own people. You see, when it comes to God... It's not just about having a godly family. It's not having just a, a good marriage, a fulfilling marriage, a fulfilling career. All those things are good. Don't get me wrong. But there has to be a reality between God and us. You see, there is an accountability, and God is almighty. And even to his own people, he calls them into account. And if they refuse and they refuse, he will discipline. And so here they were. But the, people, the Babylonians apparently had gone overboard, way overboard. And now the psalmist, the nation is saying, God, it's a bit much. Mercy is a bit much. And now he delineates, right? Now he's going to spell out the ruins the, the condition, lamentable. Lamentable means they were powerless to do anything about it. So we begin in verse 4. Um, this is the lament proper. Your adversaries have roared in the midst of your meeting place. They have set up their standards for signs. When a lion roars... It roars because it has its prey already. And right as he pounces, he roars, and the prey freezes. Boom, he gets on there. The enemy has roared. They have us. And um, they have set up their flags, their emblems. The things that reminded us of you, God, perhaps the menorah, perhaps the showbread, Perhaps all the, all the things taken out and they've put in there, perhaps, pagan gods. Their uh, 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 pagan deities or whatever it is, they've taken over. Wow. That's pretty bad news. That's bad. And remember, this is the worship leader. Where I lead worship, where I help people worship you, God, all that is gone. And the enemy has roared. It seems as one has lifted up the axe in the uh, forest of trees. And now all is carved wood. They have smashed with a hatchet and hammer. It's like Asaph knew all the furnishings. It's like, God, somebody took an axe and a hammer and started breaking everything. Everything. All the precious wood and all the gold-plated materials. Everything is destroyed, God. The thing that we, we used to worship you. Like somebody didn't care, just took a chainsaw and chopped everything down. It was hurting him because this is the way, these are the tools to worship God. And they have burned the sanctuary to the ground. And here's the worst part, second part of verse 7. They have defiled the dwelling's place of your name. God, your reputation is going down. It's supposed to be the most powerful, wonderful worship in all the world. Your name, your character, God. They have said in their heart, let us completely subdue them. They have burned all the meeting places of God in the land. 
they're completely, completely taken over. And then we don't have our things anymore. There's nothing there to remind us about you anymore. And not even a prophet to guide us. No one to lead the way in truth, God. All the prophets are gone. And on top of that, no one to guide us how long this is going to last. We're done, God, if you don't help. And don't, then he cries out, Lord, how long will the adversaries revile? Revile what? Us? No. Look what he's concerned about. What he's concerned about. What he's concerned about. You know, um, when disaster comes, the things that really, really matter in our soul surface. I was in Haiti. We went to help in tornado torn uh, Galveston, Houston. We went to tornado torn Arkansas. And uh, it's amazing, amazing. Some people come out with, look, look, this picture. That's all I've got left. They hold it to their chest. That's it. Everything else destroyed. When disaster comes, we come in touch with what really, really matters. I remember some years ago, I was counseling this couple and their marriage was coming to an end. And one of the spouse would not listen, would not listen, would not listen. Because that spouse would not listen, the other one committed adultery. I thought, the spouse that had been betrayed but wouldn't listen, I thought, they're going to get a gun. And I remember back in this, over here to my left in the playground, there used to be a wooden cross, a wooden bent over cross, kind of abandoned. One morning I came in and I looked out the window and that spouse that would not listen, that spouse that was betrayed, was at the foot of that cross, in their, on their knees, praying to God for forgiveness to them. They were asking for forgiveness for them, themselves, that they would not listen. When disaster comes, the things that really, really matter surface. And so it's better it's better to start now. And the way we start now is to be in touch with the kingdom of God. Are we obeying the kingdom of God or not? Are we wanting the will of God in our lives and in the lives of those that we're surrounded by? Not that we take the Bible and try to shove it down their throat. No, no, no. We need love and, and sensitivity, but still communicating the word of God, the will of God, the kingdom of God. And so here the psalmist is like, huh, they're reviling your name, God. Again, uh, verse 10. How long, O Lord, will the adversary revile and the enemy spurn your name forever? That's his concern, not just his own. Oh, I've got to have a worship place. Oh, the people need to have better housing. Look at their houses. They're gone. They're saving. That's not what he's worried about. It's about, he's worried about the name of God. And then in confusion again, God, why do you withdraw your hand, even your right hand? You know what that means? The hand of God means the power of God. The right hand of God means the omnipotent, all-powerful hand of God. He's in confusion. He's like, God, you're all powerful. Why don't you use that power? In fact, he says, it's very poetic when he says within your bosom, usually within your bosom is a, a place of ease, the place of mm, no worries. The psalmist is saying, even in your ease, you can destroy them, God. From your bosom, destroy, do something. Ever you and I cry out to God that way? 
You know why? Because we don't know God that well, number one. Number two, we don't allow ourselves to feel passionately. We just numb ourselves by all kinds of escapes and chemistry and pleasures to numb ourselves. And that's why sometimes disaster has to come so that we wake up and smell the coffee. Well, here the nation was being woken up. And the, 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 the worship leader was expressing, but now the worship leader says, wait, wait, wait. I need to go back and gain confidence myself. And how is he going to gain confidence himself in the midst of disaster? You know how? He goes back in history and recalls God's use of power. That's how, and that's why you and I needed time to go back and say, hmm. So let's look what he says, because now in verse 12, he makes it personal. He says, yet God is my king from of old. The Lord has been my king from of old, who works deeds of deliverance in the midst of the earth. Um, he's using the earth to show its, uh, God's physical power. And that physical power translates into spiritual power that saves us. But he goes and he, he recalls back and he says, man, God, you, you've done uh, great deeds of deliverance from the midst of the earth. And then he's going to now unpack that, right? And, and the wording from verse 13 through 17 can be, uh, and I think he starts with the deliverance from Egypt, and, and then he moves on to all creation. And brothers and sisters, that's so basic. That's so basic. But we need to go back to that. Because he goes back and he says, um, you divided the sea by your strength. You broke the heads of the sea monsters in the waters. Now, uh, <clears throat> that's most likely the deliverance from Egypt, right? The uh, Hebrews, uh, Israel, uh, was in, in captivity under the evil rule of Egypt. Slavery, and, and, and it was awful. God delivered them. And they were going, right, and they get to the Red Sea. And here comes Pharaoh with all his chariots and all his soldiers. And there's the sea, and there's Moses, and what, what? Exodus 14. Moses says, stand still. And see the salvation of God. And the water, the ocean starts opening up. And it's dry so that the Israelites can walk. And then they pass through. And then when God is done, the, the Egyptians come after the, the, the Hebrews. And God closes the water. And the army, the whole army of the Egyptians is gone. And Asaph says, man, God parted the Red Sea. God is so powerful. I have to remember that. But he doesn't stop there. In fact, he continues now. And what most of us don't understand is that what he now says, he is now uh, doing a, 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 po a polemical statement. That is, he is going against the pagans and the pagan gods. Because now in verse 14, he says, he crushed the heads of Leviathan. He gave him as food for the creatures of the wilderness. In the uh, pagan uh, world, at ancient pagan world, they would deify just about everything. The sea was a deity. And the false gods would fight against each other. And there were myths, right? And uh, the, the, the sea monsters and the, the god of the sea would, you know, maneuver all these animals. And, and then there was the, the, the god of the sun, and the sun would fight against the, the god of the sea and all this. And the, the, the Leviathan, the Leviathan was a, a creature with many heads, and it was, uh, represented chaos and disaster. And... Uh, and every year, the Canaanites would celebrate the killing of the Leviathan so that their country would do well, so that the nation would do well. And so, ah, you see, we got rid of that God. 
And what is the psalmist saying here? Listen, the sea is not God. God controls the sea. The Leviathan is not, God crushes the head of the Leviathan. The heads, plural, of the Leviathan. God is God, not your gods. Right now you are taking over our country, but God is God. And that's what the psalmist is saying. See, he goes back and rehearses the omnipotence of God. And now he says, uh, really it goes back um, further back. To creation. And perhaps in verse 15 is the, the, the flood of Noah. You broke open springs of torrents. And you dried up the flowing streams. You do whatever you want with water. Uh, verse 16. Yours is the day. Yours is the night. What does Genesis 1 say? There was day and there was night. And God said, boom, that's the way it was. And the psalmist is going back and recalling, recalling the creation and how God did it. Mere word of God. You have prepared the light and the sun. You have done it. It's not that the sun is God. You're the creator. You have established the boundaries of the earth. You have made summer and winter. <laughs> I mean, brothers and sisters, we need to think about that power. Listen. Listen. How much power would it take to change all of South Padre Island? All of it. Oh, my goodness. We're talking about years and years and years of excavation and turning this and turning that just to change one little boundary. You get out into space and you can barely see Padre, South Padre Island. Imagine the whole world God set up to here. And up to here is this ocean. This is the depth. God said that. Who can control the weather? Can anybody say, hmm, you know what? I think this year we're going to change winter. Can anybody do that? Yours is winter and summer. You control it, God. You see, the psalmist is going back in the midst of disaster. He's calling the omnipotent power of God. And now, with that confidence, now he prays to God. He earnestly prays to God. And what does he do? Look, at this is amazing. The psalmist, with all that power and everything that God has, the psalmist tries to motivate God. <laughs> Can you imagine that? I mean, this is a relationship that God wants us to have with him. That we can actually motivate him. This is just unbelievable. This is beyond my comprehension. But this is what the psalmist is doing. Look at what he does. Look at it. Don't look at me. Look at verse 18. <laughs> remember this, O oh Lord. I mean, God, huh, remember this. That the enemy has reviled and a foolish people has spurned your name. Don't forget that, God. Your reputation is on the line. Isn't that amazing? The psalmist is motivating God by pointing that, the, hey, God, your reputation is being stained here. Do something. Wow. Isn't that amazing to pray like that? You'd have to have a pretty good relationship with God, Right? I mean, when you have a friend or you have a spouse that you feel like you can impact, don't you tell them, hey, what are you doing? Why? I remember somebody telling me some years ago, I was complaining that a certain person would, uh, would call me names and yell and scream at me. You know what they told me? I was like, oh, I guess so. But they told me, man, you must be a really good friend. What? What do you mean? You think they're going to talk like that to a stranger? No, I guess not. They must have confidence that you can handle it. They must believe that you really care. Otherwise, they wouldn't say a word. Hmm. Wow. The psalmist has to know that, hey, a relationship with God, he has it. God, remember, look at your reputation. Do something. Wow. What a way to pray. You see? 
And that's the type of relationship God wants for, for us to have with him. To be open and honest. Lord, you know. Remember, your name on the stake. And then the opposite. Don't forget. One, remember. Now in verse uh, 19. Uh, do not deliver your, uh, the soul of your turtle dove to the beast. Do not forget the life of your afflicted forever. Uh, God, uh, they're your enemies, reviling your name. And all these salvation work. I mean, we're your dove. You, 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 you suffered for us. You redeemed us. You gave us your name. We're, we're yours, God. You want your turtle dove, your dove to get hurt? Wow. What a way to relate to God. Amazing. <laughs> That's what he says. It's right there. Don't let your turtle dove, don't let your people to the wild beast. Do not forget the life of your afflicted forever. And then here's another motivation, a third one. <laughs> Consider the covenant. God, you made promises. You made promises, God, that you would be with us, that you would protect us, that you would save us, that you would guard us, that you would have a relationship with us no matter what. Always, always, always. God, you promised. Wow. And by the way, the word there is it's a legal thing. Uh, consider your, uh, your covenant. This is legal, God. This is legal. You promised. It's in Deuteronomy. It's all over the place, God. This is your covenant. Consider your promises. Mm. Uh, and why? Because there's violence everywhere, God. Your people are not at peace. Your people are not at peace, God. And you promised that you would protect them. There's violence in every dark place. You see? He's praying to God. And he doesn't stop there. Verse 21. Let not the oppressed return uh, dishonored. Let the afflicted and needy praise your name. Once again, what God is concerned about. His own character. And the psalmist is saying, God... Those that have trusted you, even through this disaster, they keep trusting you. Don't let them be ashamed, God. Don't let them be ashamed because they trusted in you. In fact, the poor that have trusted in you, help them go back and praise your name, your character, your nature, who you are. You are all powerful, loving, faithful God. And when you deliver them, they will go back and praise you, God. You see? Isn't that amazing how the psalmist is trying to motivate God? Open and honest, straight up. And then verse uh, 22 and 23 are kind of like summary of his prayer, arise, O God, and plead your own cause. I mean, be your own attorney and your own judge, God, but do something. Plead your own cause. Remember how the foolish man reproaches you all day long. Do not forget the voice of your adversaries, the uproar of those who raise against you, which ascends Continually, they're, they're vocal, God. They are vocal. We may be all quiet, but they're vocal against you. They reject and they don't hide it. God, remember that. Don't forget that, God. Your name is being stained all over the place. So again, I say, in overwhelming disaster, God's people must recall God's sovereign power and continue to earnestly pray. If we don't care about something, we won't pray much. Right? If one of my children all of a sudden goes to the hospital and they're in critical condition, let me tell you, I'm going to care a lot. If my wife all of a sudden has tremendous trouble and has to be in the hospital, let me tell you, I'm going to be on my knees. I'm going to be praying earnestly. For us, all of those is true. But first and foremost, it must be about the kingdom of God. The kingdom of God. Well, uh, let me go through some, a couple of two or three applications of this message from Psalm 74. Uh, first of all, 
uh, though it did not come through as much because I don't think this psalm brings that out as much. I think this psalm is about bringing out the, the overwhelming disaster. But when we call the historical setting of this psalm, that this was probably when God was disciplining the children of Israel and the uh, Babylons had come and taken over, overwhelmingly destroyed the country, uh, the, the, the Israel, uh, Jerusalem in particular, the sanctuary and the dwelling place of God. Uh, but it was discipline. It got, all this had happened. So my first application is this. Ready? We must not reject the discipline of our Lord, our loving Lord. Because we can be tempted to become bitter. We can be tempted to become bitter and just complain and bellyache. But once again, the reason why sometimes we just bellyache and complain is because we're not seeing, we're not concerned about the kingdom of God. We're concerned about ourselves, my health, my money, my education, my friends, my happiness, my fulfillment. Lord, I have pain. Lord, I have problems. Lord, me, 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 me. And we're not concerned about the kingdom of God. You see? And so when discipline comes, we can become bitter because we're not concerned about the kingdom of God. So I say, do not become hardened. Do not reject the discipline of the Lord. Why? Because God is interested in developing us. God is interested in maturing us. Well, for us to become stronger in the faith. For us to become better agents for the kingdom of God. Become more like Christ. Right? The fruit of righteousness, Hebrews uh, 12 says. That's, so he brings discipline. Whom he loves, the Lord scourges. Whom he loves, the Lord disciplines. Do not reject the discipline of the Lord. If you're going through some discipline, but then you may have friends, somebody else is going through some discipline. Don't just try to get them out of the trouble. Be there with them. Hurt with them. Suffer with them. And help them apply truth. Don't just try to relieve their pain. Because you may be short-circuiting God's discipline and helping that person, you see. So first application, must not reject the discipline of our loving Lord. Application number two, and comes right out of the first uh, word, verse there. Um, we must cry to God and not become bitter and withdraw. Uh, we must cry out to God. You know, one of the things that happens in relationships when something goes wrong and we don't want to deal with it, we leave it alone. We no longer talk to that person, right? We stay away from them. Uh, we don't deal with it. Well, with God, it must not be that way. We must run to him. Maybe we need to cry and, 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 and be honest like this brother was doing in Psalm 74. But cry out to him. Relate to him. Tell him, I'm mad, God. Lord, I'm dying. Lord, I'm lonely. Lord, I'm frustrated. Lord, I'm whatever. I'm confused, God. Whatever it is, but relate to him. Cry to him. Uh, because we belong to you, right? Uh, verse 2. Remember your congregation which you have purchased from of all, which you have redeemed. God, this is your work. I'm your work. You saved me from hell. You're, you're working with me, God. I don't know what you're doing. I'm confused, but help me here. Cry out to God. Because if you don't, you will withdraw. Like any other relationship. Spend time with God. Mm, I know I should, but... Nah. And we just kind of excuse it, but many times we don't want to talk to him. Like somebody has heard us and we're not going to talk to him. No. Cry out to God. The psalmist went back to him. And then that's what's going to help. You know what else is going to help? What did the psalmist do? The psalmist went back in history. Right? The psalmist went back in, in history. And the power of God. And sometimes that's what you and I need to do. Uh, look at the ocean. 
Look at the sky. Look at the stars. They didn't just appear just like that. God created. And look at your own personal life. Are you breathing? You have plenty to eat? Have you been taught the word of God? Do you know the gospel? If you know the gospel, God has given you his Holy Spirit. You have probably one or two or three or four Bibles. If not, you have a phone, you have a lot of Bibles. God has given us and given us and given us and given us and given us. Look back in your own history. And then, and then, when I look back at my history and I see how unfaithful I have been to him and how faithful he has been to me, it's like, wow, God. What I'm going through right now, the little frustrations that I have are nothing. You've been so, so good to me. And that's what can help when we're going through disaster, bad times. Recall God's power to save you and how he has delivered you and how have you, you know the word of God. You see, that helps. Cry out to him. Recall his great works in the past in your own life, in creation. Then finally, here's my last application. Uh, we must live for Jesus and his kingdom. We must live for Jesus and his kingdom. I want you to note several things in this psalm. Uh, you thought, oh no, you're just going to start the sermon? No. Look, just real quick. Right, real quick. Look at verse 8. Uh, sorry, verse 7. Verse 7. They have burned your sanctuary to the ground. They have defiled the dwelling place of what? Your name. Look at verse 10. How long, O Lord, will the adversary revile and the enemy spurn what? Your name. Look at verse 18. Remember this, O Lord, that the enemy has reviled and the foolish people have spurned what? Your name. Verse 21. Let not the oppressed return dishonored. Let the afflicted and needy praise what? Your name. And we can look at other pronouns talking about God. You see, the psalmist was focusing on the character of God. The kingdom of God. The will of God. The name of God. That's what you and I need to be focusing on. The way we dress. The way we talk. Do we honor or dishonor God? The, the values that we have and all that we're choosing. Are we seeking to obey God? Or just seeking to have a better life ourselves? Because when we do not focus on the name of God, when we do not focus on the kingdom of God, we become superficial. It's no longer about the gospel of Jesus Christ. It's about our happiness, our fulfillment, what's going to be safe for us. And this psalm teaches us that in the midst of disaster, the worship leader kept his eye on what's truly, truly valuable. God and his kingdom. And in our times in the New Testament, we know that to be Jesus Christ and his kingdom. And you can ask all kinds of questions from there. How am I living? Am I living for Jesus or not? You can go to the Lord and say, Lord, help me understand. Help me see, Lord. Help me see. Because that's what's truly valuable. Not whether our country becomes better or not, though that is important. Not whether I have the greatest job and all the monies that I need. No, it's not the most important. Whether I have all my health and everything. No, that's not most important. Whether my wife and I, uh, or she loves me or not, as important as it is, that's not the greatest thing. It's whether I'm looking for the kingdom of God, whether I'm obeying the kingdom of God. But each one of us has to decide and ask God to help. Heavenly Father, thank you for this psalm. Thank you, Father, that you love us. 
that although you know that we're a mess, you are working in us. You are, re you are changing us, transforming us. That we are your work, God. So we ask for your mercy, your grace. Thank you. Thank you for your word, Father. Father, I pray for each and every one that's here. If there's someone here that's so wounded, Lord, that you would heal. If there's someone here that's so ashamed that they would know the profound forgiveness and restoration of Jesus Christ. Father, with all of us, we pray for your, your presence with us, Father, your love. We pray in Jesus' name. Amen. So let